Well, to discuss this, let's go to San Antonio, Texas, where we're joined by Mansour al kahia He's the author of Libya's Gaddafi, The Politics of Contradiction. In Paris is Libyan academic and journalist Mustafa Fetouri. And in London is uh, Jamal Gamati. He's the head of the Tahrir Party in Libya and member of the UN-backed political dialogue group. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. Jamal Gamati, let me begin with you. On this very program, not too long ago, we were talking about Heftar's future, whether he was going to live when we heard that he had irreversible brain damage. Now we're talking about a man who controls the east of the country, most of the south of the country. Has he committed atrocities along the way? Well, according to international human rights organizations, uh, people who are under his command have absolutely, and we have seen video footage and many, many uh, proofs of, of committing atrocities in the east uh, and possibly in the south as well, in, in the cities of Murzig and other places, especially against Tabu. But um, we leave that to the judiciary in Libya, and we leave that to uh, the International Criminal Court, and we leave that to international human rights organizations to follow and document that. Okay, so Mansour al kahia if this can be proven, doesn't it mean that essentially the man that many want to control the country and the man that's jostling for power with Siraj is a warlord and he's committing atrocities? Yes, a simple question, the answer to your question is yes. If he has done that, yes. But I don't, you see, I know the man. I don't think he will order the killing of innocent civilians. He will not do, do that. That, that you have under him working rogue uh, uh, officers or rogue uh, in, in, in individuals would do that? Yes, I would say this. But, you know, you, 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 you have to give everything its own shape. And basically what you're dealing with, you're dealing with the lawless area of the country that has been lawless for many years, that we have gangs coming in from Chad, from Najar, from other nowhere, okay? And there's no law and order. So basically, when, he, when, when, his, when his forces go in there, he, they have to deal with these issues. That they killed, that they killed people innocently, and I agree with you. They should be held and should be held, held accountable. And I agree with Mr. Igmati that the, that the law, legal system should uh, come into to, to effect. But uh, that these things mm -hmm. happen, yes, they do happen constantly. Mustafa, is that an accurate description of the current situation on the ground? Yes, more or less, I would agree with that. It's uh, quite accurate, actually. And uh, I, I, I just want to add something here, you know. Uh, I, I don't, you know, again, just uh, like our colleague said from, uh, from the States, it's very unlikely that Haftar uh, will, will order any kind of killing or mass killing or brutality against civilians or otherwise even fighters. But the point is, in Libya uh, today, I mean, since 2011, there is no law and order, especially in the south and in bar most parts of the eastern of the country, before uh, Mr. Haftar manages to take over. I prefer to say the army, not him personally. And the other thing is, uh, I know, for instance, for example, since uh, probably 2016, late 2017, there was a team in the United States who are trying to uh, bring a case, uh, a criminal case, against Mr. Hafter because uh, they, they allege that he has committed uh, crimes against the humanity and he was involved with inviting uh, outside the United States since he is uh, a U.S. citizen, so they can prosecute him. The question is, it's very unlikely that something like this will happen. That's the first thing. The second thing, uh, especially when it comes to the recent advances of the Libyan army under his command in the south of the country, I, I, I really doubt much of the reports we have been seeing or hearing. I was in the country, I just came back about a week ago. And uh, what really happened in Murzig, which is a very unfortunate actually, right. the number of civilians who were killed most likely is less than 20. And the other important thing, which but is certainly that which doesn't is make it right, does it? is the fact most of those. Them, most of it doesn't make it right. No, even of if course it not. No, it's very unfortunate. It's still, no, of course not. I agree with you. I mean, it's very unfortunate, even if one person is killed. But one important point here is that Murzig has been almost more or less for the last two and a half years taken over by Tabu from Chad, mainly from Chad and uh, some from Niger as well. And the problem with those people is that they want to force themselves on the locals because they, they are related to them, blood-related and tribal-related. 
because they, we have some taboos there, some Libyan taboos, and they want to become Libyans, you know. And when Haftar got, got there, you know, got very close, the, the, the mistake he made, probably, was that he, the supporting forces that were supporting him in the ground, actually from a, a tribe called the Ulad Sleiman, mainly located in Sabha, and they were leading the fight uh, towards Morzag, and th there is a, a huge animosity between right. the Sleiman tribe and the Tabu, and that's what really happened. Okay. But I don't really hold, respons uh, hold Mr. Haftar responsible for that. I want to bring in Juma here to talk about the politics. So there's this meeting in Abu Dhabi. They had the meeting, Siraj and Haftar. They spoke about moving forward, peace talks, and hopefully wanting elections. How would you describe the atmosphere of those talks and if they were serious or not? Actually, uh, sources confirmed that um, the discussions that took place in Abu Dhabi led to no concrete agreement. Nothing was uh, agreed or finalized, and nothing was signed. There were exchanges of ideas to do with um, the issue of who should be the uh, supreme commander, whether um, uh, Haftar would submit to and accept that there would be a civilian uh, supreme commander to the forces, like the head of the state, or in our case at the moment, the head of the GNA, the Government of National Accord, which would be Faiz Sarraj. And then what will uh, the title of or the job of a general commander of the army mean and entail? And is it a position that can be changed, or is it a position that has to be reserved for Mr. Haftar for life? These are the kind of discussions that took place. Nothing has been agreed. I think it's a continuation of other discussions that took place in Cairo right. to attempt to unite the Libyan army. And, I, and, and by the way, uh, Mr. Sarraj and Haftar are only two parties, uh, two sides of right. the Libyan landscape, political landscape. So there are many, many other very important sides and parties that need to be brought in allow and me, they need to be part of any solution. But Juma, Juma, allow me for a second to just look at what's in it for Haftar to go to elections, right? He doesn't have any incentive, does he? He's taking up more and more territory as we go along amid the lawlessness because his militia is the strongest. He has the oil. He's controlling big parts of the country. Why would he ever want to go into a political settlement? There's nothing incentivizing him, is there? Okay, well, there are two issues here. First of all, let me just uh, take, uh, talk about the issue of extending his military campaign to the south. There are two motives. There is a declared official motive and there is a hidden motive. The declared official motive, motive is that he is trying to kick uh, or expel or eradicate foreign militias from Chad and Niger who are uh, causing havoc in Libya, which is fine, which is which is an acceptable uh, uh, reason. However, there is, there is double standards here. There is, because uh, at the same time, Haftar is using foreign militias to fight on his side as uh, mercenaries. And I'm talking about the Sudanese Darfurian opposition group, Justice and, and, and Equality. The hundreds of them are fighting alongside Haftar, and he's paying them mm -hmm. money as mercenaries to fight with him. So isn't there a hypocrisy here? Isn't there double standard here? If Mr. Haftar wants to kick all foreign militias causing criminality and, and, and havoc in Libya, we should kick all of them, whether they are Chadian, whether they are Nigers, or whether they are Sudanese. So that is that that that, that uh, torpedoes this, this premise that he's kicking out foreign then, militias. So, so. Now, and the hidden, the hidden motive, the hidden real motive is, is to convert his politic, politic, military campaign into a political gain. And in fact, I disagree with you. I think Haftar is in a hurry to have elections even before a permanent constitution. He has been pushing very hard, and his supporters and his sponsors, the Emiratis, have been pushing mm -hmm. hard for quick, snappy presidential election without a solid constitutional base, without a permanent constitution, because time is not on Haftar side. Right. The man is nearly 80. So that's why he wants to uh, el uh, some sort of elections that we he thinks he will win outright and will get him to power and then he will turn against uh, the idea of elections and democracy altogether and he will establish a military dictatorship rule in Libya again. Mustafa, does it suit Haftar to ask and to push for those elections? Well, um, um, I mean, the, the question of elections is regardless of what has been said about Mercedes, because everybody seems to have used them, you know, and uh, even Gaddafi uh, have been accused of that. 
and nobody has proved anything so far. But uh, you know, Haftar is in the, in the road to become the main figure in Libya. How you translate that into politics, I, I don't really know. You know, becomes a president, becomes whatever. For the, you know, based on the reality today, the man controls almost two thirds of the country. This is one thing. The other side, combined, all the others who are uh, against him or opposing him, they have miserably failed so far over the last eight years to uh, produce anything, to provide anything for the Libyans, or at least the Libyans they control, they name, uh, the, namely in, in Western Libya. This is one thing. The other thing, this is a man, I mean, I mean Mr. Hafter, uh, who have, uh, you know, kind of deep feeling that he has the right, you know, some kind of a historical right, if you like, to run the country uh, because he has been, you know, living abroad for a long time after he failed with, uh, fall out with, uh, with, uh, with Gaddafi and he was uh, a refugee in the United States for quite some time. And he came back specifically for this purpose. This is one thing. The other thing or strong motive that really pushes him is the fact what he saw in 2000, after 2011 and how he was actually denied any role uh, uh, after the uh, the immediate war in 2011 uh, ended in uh, the civil war ended in October 2011, the same year when Gaddafi was murdered, he, he was pushed aside. He was right. sidelined. He was denied. You know, if we go to election today, you know, or next week, or the month after, or something, I believe he will have some kind of a serious serious channel uh, challenge he he will he will be a very serious challenge to anybody okay. the man has the popularity because okay, of what so he did in East Libya and okay. he is gaining popularity and he, okay. he, and okay. he he can easily translate his military gains into political victory yes please Mansour if an election was declared today would have to be the winner no not necessarily yeah, but this this is this is the major issue i mean it's very easy to hate I mean, you hate somebody. Well, I don't like. Listen to me. Look at what Libya is going through for the last eight years. I'm not saying Hector is, a, is the is the panacea for, for 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 all Libya's ills. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm trying to tell you is that eight years for eight years after Gaddafi, look at what we have in the country. Look at the lawlessness, the, the, the corruption, the 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 this the, the facade of of democracy that we say we have a government that says, well, you didn't elect me, you didn't put me in power, uh, the, the Europeans did. We have a government in the east that's a feat, this whole awful government. You know, we really are in a desperate situation in Libya. We really are. Hector has played it smart. He really has played it very smart. He has entered those those areas without using too much force, the minimal amount of force. And he learned this from Benghazi. He destroyed half of Benghazi. But then moving otherwise, why does he go to Misrata? Why does he go to Sirte? Why does he go to Tripoli? In Tripoli, he'll be welcomed with, with open arms. But he's doing it, he's, he's eating bit by bit. So he's, he's garnering support. Whether he will win in the elections, it, it's mm -hmm. up to the Libyan people. Libyans have been they've been very forthcoming in voting, 84%, 85%. Right. They'll vote. <laughs> but but under the circumstances, we have to put this country in order in terms of lawlessness and type mm -hmm. of respect of law, respect of life and property. And, that, and no one's been doing that. Okay. He's so let's, doing so that. let me ask Juma. So Juma, because Mansour believes there's a facade of democracy, that's why we need to lower the bar of the democratic credentials of anybody. It wants to take over right now because the context is it's been eight years of hell for the Libyan people. You need a law and order candidate, not a fake UN backed government that doesn't even control the bulk of the country. Well, no one is saying that uh, next year we're going to have a, a perfect democracy emulating the Scandinavian or North European democracies. Uh, of course, we are starting from a very, very low point because for 42 years it's been a, a total hell, you know, uh, despotism, dictatorship, denying people any form of political participation or, or, or practicing a polity. Uh, but, but what the Libyan people aspire to, the majority of them, is that I, we ha uh, to be honest with you, we have two options on the table. We have two choices now. Either we move forward to establish a civilian 
state, constitutional state, run by civilians based on elections, and it will be just the start of democratization. Democratization is an accumul accumulative sorry, that, pro that process. Will never work. It, 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 it has to improve with years and, and decades, or we regress back to one man military dictatorship, which we had for 42 years. Remember, Haftar was part with Gaddafi was part of that military coup that took place on September 1st 1969 that toppled a, a constitutional legal monarchy political system and we had 42 years of dictatorship now the Libyans want to establish another constitutional legal civilian political system that uh, actually draws its legitimacy right. from the people but Haftar wants to deny us that he wants to regress us back to the 42 years of Gaddafi these are the two choices how, how do we know? To listen, 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 listen Mustafa, we are him, Mustafa but, we but are out of time you know listen gentlemen we are, we are out of time but listen we can continue this very soon Gigantic answers about the future of Libya. We will no doubt have you all back on the show very soon. Mansour al-Kahiyya, Mustafa Fetouri, and Jamal Gamati, I thank you all once again for joining us here on the Newsmakers.